Y allá afuera, no te iba a viajar. Y viajar, no podía, yo tenía que hacerlo todo. Hasta lo tuve que hacer. that same day, but it's at 5 o'clock in the evening, and Northwest District uh, Annual Convention is coming up April 10th and 12th, and we'll have more information as we move along on that. There's an evening uh, service today at 5, and it says the video testimony of Tim Mahoney, the producer of some of the films we have watched, including The Journey to Mount Sinai, The Red Sea Crossing, and The Moses Controversy. It's a marvelous testimony of God working all things together, which is good. I don't know if you're going to watch that all tonight or watch it in portions, but at least it'll start tonight. If not. Mm. Well, I've heard that over the years. <laughs> but um, I, I, have, I have the opposite experience in my house. I can tell the people, the children, what to do, and they just kind of stop particular and he won't say anything. If I whisper his name, he says, What? <laughs> so he obviously hears, but he hears kind of what he wants to hear. And, uh, and, and my wife says I remember, I resemble that. So that's kind of the way. That's kind of the way it goes sometimes. I'm sure I do that myself. Yeah, it's men that have to learn that skill. Well, I've shared with you that my wife has told me at least once, if not more that when uh, I've been preoccupied doing something, reading, watching something, whatever, she was talking to me, and she'll say, you're not listening, are you? And I repeat back, <laughs> not a good idea for, uh, for you, Randy, but I, I'm just, I repeat back everything she said to me. She says, you're not listening to me. So I have come to believe that listening has something more than, has more than just hearing the words somebody is saying and repeating back to them. It must mean, Paying attention, mm -hmm. or, yeah, it, it, it means more than just that. So, just for you guys that might not know that, that's what it means. It means mm -hmm. more than just repeat the words mm -hmm. back. Yeah, it might mm -hmm. be worse if you can't even repeat the words back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you're really, really not to see it at all. Yeah. So. Those are the opportunities, those are the things we have coming up. An opportunity also, we've changed locks, we haven't changed locks in a long time, and we needed to really uh, re-people some doors, not all, but some. And a lot of the mechanisms had broke, or they were really hard to open, in some of the doors, and, uh, and we did that. And then it was suggested we put deadbolt locks in on uh, several of our doors, where they those would, two, yeah, they would be easier to break in. And so the cost of that would be about 350 to turn the board. We'll revisit that. Uh, but we wanted to give an opportunity to anybody to donate to that. If you do, put dead bolts on it or door, door locks or something, and we'll know where it's going. Uh, is there any uh, birthdays or anniversaries today? Any birthdays or anniversaries? Any other announcements? Just tonight's service, the movie. I did I did mention it that there's I wasn't listening. I, <laughs> that's when the microphone died. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's my excuse. But but it is it's the journey to Mount Sinai, the producer of that, Tim Mahoney, the Red Sea Cross and the Moses controversy. Uh, they're uh, movies that he had uh, made or videos that he had made and we're gonna uh, be listening to them this evening at five o'clock. Is there any other announcements? 
Lord Jesus, Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your presence with us. We ask you to guide, direct, and bless us and set the broad your spirit upon us. And Lord, we know that there are many absent today, and I know where many of them are. But Lord, uh, we ask that you would reach out and touch and encourage them, strengthen them, and bring them into the body. We'll give you the praise as you do that, the body of Christ, the church, as uh, you, you've uh, made an opportunity for us to be involved in. Help us to, uh, to be attentive to that and to incorporate it into our lives because it's your wish for us and it's your wish for those that you've given us that we would be part of an organization a, that is not just an organization, that is empowered by you, chosen by you to do your work. And we thank you for the opportunity we have to do that. We pray all these things. And my pastor God to bring the word. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Those are good, those are good requests. It's a big one. It's a big one. I had a friend one time who her husband after many years left and she had five children and everybody kept telling her to say, well, the Lord won't give you more than you can handle. Mm -hmm. And it's true, Don. The Lord, the Lord won't give you more than you can handle. But she had an answer for me. She says, I think the Lord has an inflated opinion of my ability to handle things at this particular time. We say, oh, that sounds unspiritual. But yeah, there's times when we doubt. And that's why it's good to make requests, right? Yes. Amen. Yes. Because uh, the, the enemy only has doubt really to use against us. Hey, raise your hand if you know what Chris is going through. Have you ever not got a job you applied for? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Look yeah. around you. We can comfort you with the comfort that we've had. I get all the jobs. I get all the jobs. <laughs> <laughs> Whether I want them or not. See, yeah, it's like everything in life. Some people wish they <laughs> didn't have as many jobs and others wish they had it. And so it just, yeah, we could just get it, get it balanced out. He knows how to make old town. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other prayer requests? I think it's near to dear to all of us. Of course, we're glad you guys are back and the good report you have. Looking forward to hearing on that. I think it's near and dear to all of us that uh, our children. And so, of course, no matter how old they get, they're still your children, so you pray for them, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, and your grandchildren. So let's, let's go. Lord Jesus, Heavenly Father, we just thank you again. We lift up these requests to you several and Lord they're, they're, your, they're your people that have concerns about things in their life that they would like to see happen. Sarah's asked for a uh, prayer for her and Lord uh, she's going to be looking like she's going to take care of Maria. Maria's, uh, she's on her way so she doesn't know she has the strength to do that but she feels that God will give it to her but she's asking for prayer. And Chris is looking for uh, some, just, just being a new Christian uh, and in that walk and uh, we expect sometimes when we become a Christian that everything's just going to work out. It does, but sometimes <laughs> it's, on a, it's on a, a timeline that we just think is, 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 is unrealistic for us. And yet God is always on time. He's on time in your life too. And he's, he's working towards helping you with that. But John, we lift John to you and we ask you to continue to bless him. Randy and Heather as they continue their journey. We look for a good report from the doctors. We thank you for the medical help that uh, Jose and Mariana have received from uh, Jose and uh, we look, we look forward to the, this continued healing. But for our children, we lift them to you. We ask you to undertake and you enter into them in their circumstances for Pastor Don and this recovery that you continue it. And Lord, for those who are looking for other answers today, there is no other answer. I mean, help, I mean yes, there's other things we can do. Yeah, that's true. We can do this and we can do that. Yes. But for everything else, there's Jesus. And that's what we're talking about, the thing that's everything else, which is the big thing. None of the rest of it really can take place until that is settled. So help people not to accept the, the view of this world, which is really the view of Satan, that there are other, there are other possibilities for you. There's only Jesus. Jesus is the answer. And help them to see that and to come to that realization and to dedicate their life uh, to Christ and his work. And Lord, we don't know if it'll take place here in another church, but it needs to take place. The Lord doesn't need it. You need it. And the people of the Lord is placing your hand. Guide and direct and bless us and always request it more. Uh, for Pastor God anoint the word and anoint our lives. Not so we can just be anointed, but so that we can do your work. So the word is like Chris. We just don't know sometimes we can do it or not. And we really can't without you. So anoint us so that we can do your work. Anoint Sarah again so she can do that work. Anoint the spouses of these that are sick so that they can be a help to them in their journey. Anoint those who are sick. And we'll give you the praise as you do it. Yes, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I'll just give you a, a word from my dad. If you want God to bless your life, invest yourself into the little ones. The old people are crusty. The little ones that God wants Amen. to look for. God bless you guys. It's not such a big crowd today. Kathy, I have to tell them this, at least part of this story that I told you on the way in. My wife said, Don, you're going to be all talked out by the time you get to church. I said, I bet I'm not. 
<laughs> the, I know this comedian, I've been watching his career for years, and his name's Michael Jr. If you've ever heard of Michael Jr. When he was first starting out, you know, you, you kind of go anywhere you can just to make it in the business. And so he had some really good contacts. He got to be on The Tonight Show. He got to be speaking in some of the big things. But one of the things they did is because he never swears. He learned how to break the habit of permit just swearing. And he did an act, and a big shot said, you don't swear. He goes, how come you don't swear in your outfit? He just says, my mom could come in the back and hit me. So I'm not going to swear. Anyway, here's a story, and I can relate to this. I, I've done a funerals in a pool hall before. I've done some unexpected things in ministry before. He got an invitation to do a program, a, a comedy routine in a prison. And it was with some Christian guys who thought, well, okay, we'll bring the prisoners into a sanctuary, I guess, and I'll, and I'll just do my routine like a regular nightclub, you know? So he gets to the prison, and he's the only guy that shows up. And there were three or four guards, and they escorted him into the first chamber, and they said, well, you got to take your belt off. He said, my, my pants won't stay up. He said, no, you can't take it in there because the prisoners might hang you with it. He goes, well, I don't know about having saggy pants in a prison. Maybe that's not a good thing either. But I said, get down. So he gave him his belt. He took him into the next area, and they shut off both sides behind him, and there was only one guard left. So he gets into the next area, bowel of inside of the prison and the guard goes well this is as far as I go there's your audience and there were a whole room full of prisoners sitting on a floor with a blank spot in the middle and he said I want to tell you this folks I didn't have that kind of routine I didn't even know what I was going to say it scared me so bad Angus he lost words and he's saying oh God help me help me help me to hit it off with this group of guys are they might kill me. I mean, this, it could get bad. He's walking. He said, halfway through the crowd, he didn't have anything to say. Three quarters of the way through the crowd, he didn't, he didn't know what he's going to say. He stepped next to the circle, and he stepped into the circle. And he looked down, and there was a man that had a white beard and white hair. And he looks down at him, and he goes, Moses, when the warden comes, you tell him to let my people go. And the whole crowd erupted in laughter, and he won the day. And the rest of it was history. He was able to identify with the people that are there. So I hope you laugh today. I hope you cry today. I hope the Lord speaks to you in a special way. Today is a great day. Amen. Today is the day that you have. Tomorrow you don't get. You don't have yesterday. You got right now, so why don't you enjoy yourselves? Why don't you? If you laugh, I don't care. If you throw things, I'll duck. But I feel pretty good. I want you to see that. Um, well, this is where we are in this church right here in the middle. Everybody recognize that? That's us. Mm -hmm. That's the church of Jesus Christ on this corner right there. This one is the one my brother-in-law went to Bible college and got his, got ordained and got out of Bible college and went to West Seattle. And that was his first church. Well, was it his first church or second church? It was the only one that I went to. And then... Bethel Church over there is the one that we spent eight years working in ministry, and I cut my teeth, and uh, Pastor Saffold taught me to uh, not overextend myself and to be able to stand on our two feet so Kathy and I could minister and not be drained out dry and thrown away by the church. Is that, That's a good estimation of what could happen to you. If you love the Lord so much, the people take advantage of you till you're wrung out. So don't do that. I taught a class on that. Don't do that. Do what God can allow you to do. And so we ministered there for a long time. <laughs> Pastor Saffel passed away two weeks ago. And I told his daughter this, and Brad, Brad would be okay with this because it was always our ongoing joke. He was a Ford guy. His dad made him a Ford guy. And I always told him, I said, Brad, I said, them Fords are going to kill you before you're done. I said, he, do you really? Well, we didn't argue anymore, Angus, because he was never going to change. He was always going to be a Fordite, and I was always going to be Chevy Dodge guy, you know? <laughs> so we went on all of our lives. So he's 86 now. 
and they took him to a doctor, and he was great inside. He checked out with the doctor. They took him out into the parking lot, loaded him up into the pickup, and he lost his breath and passed away. And I asked his daughter, I said, did you load him into that Ford pickup? And she said, yeah. He said, I told you that the Fords were going to kill him in the end, and it did. It's a Ford guy. And I told that at the car club meeting this week. I said, Ford's going to get you guys. I know I have a Thunderbird. I have a Mercury. I had a Ford motorhome. I know. I said, it's kind of like dog doo-doo. You can't quite get it off your feet, but you can live with it. And I said, after all, and this was Angus, this was a treading on ice. They all thought a new person came to the meeting because I had never been this auditory. I said, you know, it could have been worse, Steve. I said, it could have been a Studebaker. Because ah! there are a lot of Studebakers people in that club. But anyway, that was the ministry level there, level there. This here is a picture of the church that my great grandparents built when they came from Holland. They didn't, I was telling, um, I don't know, was it Julio this morning, but they didn't have a piano. And so the Swears ordered a piano from New York, and it came through the Panama Canal, and it came to the Dalles, and it came on a covered wagon to the Swear farm. So when they wanted to have Wednesday night choir time, they came to the Swear house to listen to that piano. And I have that piano in that cheese in my garage. We don't, none of us know how to play a piano. But anyway, I inherited this thing. But that's their house. That tower right there has bell in it. My great uncle and his brothers, they were ornery, sort of. I don't know where it comes from, but they were ornery. They took the bell out of it and changed it with the school bell. So that Sunday morning when the church bell rang, Everybody got up and got dressed for school. <laughs> the funny thing is it never got changed back. And I saw that bell, and it's like a U.S. government bell. It, they never changed the two back. The tone told you what to do. They also took a covered uh, buggy and put it up behind the cupola on the roof for Halloween. Yeah, pretty ornery. I don't, I don't know where I don't get that from them anyway. And then this one above it there is the church we went down to Oregon to help rebuild. And right there next to the cupola, just that side of it, I'll never forget this, Angus, I was up there putting the ridge cap on. We had got it all done. I was finishing up the ridge cap. And the one old boy looks up at me and goes, you know, Pastor, when they were building the church, a guy fell from right there and he died. <laughs> I said, you took right now to tell me that story? <laughs> he died right there? He goes, oh, no, no, he didn't die right there. They took him down to the Hood River Hospital, and then he died. <laughs> I said, well, thank you for that comfort. And I know for a fact that if you could blow that picture up, you would see some bending marks on the metal, because I hunkered down on that thing, and I, I had to pray before I could even move on, because all of a sudden, Chrissy got tall. He got scary, and I wasn't scared the whole time. They told me that story. He landed right here, Pastor. I go, Flip, Flip, why did you tell me that now? These are the churches that we have been associated with. I couldn't find all of them. I couldn't find my old picture of First Church, but you want to know this, that Jesus Christ loved the church, and he gave himself up for her to make her holy and cleanse her by the washing with water through the Word. That's why the preaching of the Word is paramount. It's not the singing of choruses. It's the preaching of the Word that confuses, that confounds the devil. It's the preaching, and then out of that comes the music. That's how we can sing to the Lord, because something that took place in our hearts and so it is cleansing the church through the power of the word. Guys, it's never the preacher talking at you. I don't know about other preachers, but I don't have a picture of you in my computer background or on the wall going, what can I say to manipulate that? No. 
It's always the Word of God being spread out. And, and as a point, I told my joke and I didn't say my prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Word today. Uh, make it live in our hearts and lives. Allow us the strength to uh, deliver the words as they needed to be laid out in our hearts and lives. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And he wants to present her to himself as a radiant church without a stain, without a wrinkle, or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. He died for the church so that he could present them to him. That's why I believe in a triune God. If you don't believe in a triune God, it's going to blow your mind. Jesus and God, he died so that God could receive you and I. And you want to remember, holiness is in direct relationship to your position in the kingdom. The labor in the temple is called holy. Your life in the temple is holy because you need to understand what blameless means. He didn't say perfect because he knows that in our infinite minds, we're not perfect. I have to remind my wife that every time I make bread because the crumbs fall on the floor in front of there. And Chris, I try to clean them up, but I kind of never get them all just right. Blameless means anytime the Holy Spirit checks my heart, I respond. There's a whole sermon on that because you can't clutter your life up with so much job, so much music, so much whatever, that he can't tap you on the shoulder and go, Hey, let's, uh, let's change this thing. Let's do this a little differently. And so he wants to present his church. The church is important enough that, number one, he'll finance it. That's why we tithe. He's not going to start something and go, well, they can't make it. I want to tell you this. I, won't, I don't want to miss this in my sermon because it just sticks in my crop. The government tells you you can't assemble together as they have to some. They're wrong. They're wrong. The Bible tells us we have to. We have to be together. So we get in a, I, I, just, I just can't get over, I had a boom truck in the parking lot. We got a boom truck, and then we had Marvin's pickup in the parking lot. You may have to do it different, but you don't want to not meet together because we collectively have a mighty power, a mighty strength of the Spirit of God. Because when you're weak, when I'm weak, you can be strong. And when you have problems, you can have God intervene in your problem. I can know that He'll intervene in my problem. Amen? Things about the church that you need to understand. God takes injust very seriously. Injustice very... My tongue, did you feel my tongue get stuck to the roof of my mouth there for a minute? Listen to this. <clears throat> We're told to defend the weak and the fatherless, uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed, rescue the weak and the needy, and deliver them from the hand of the wicked. In Jesus' name, we have gone to protect other people all around the world, and I'll tell you where it fails. Without using a swear word, people get involved, and they're greedy money lovers, self-loving individuals that mess this whole thing up. I'm not going to go there, but you need to understand this. Our call as believers is to stand in between the gap between evil and good. It's our job to speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves and for the rights of who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Not that you have no judgment. You can't judge me. You can only judge with the arm stick that you use on yourself. To judge rightly is to say, oh, God has revealed this to me, therefore I know that's bad. I know that's wrong. Not to have no, no judgment at all. The tightrope walker can't use that. If there's only three strands of rope on the rope, you don't want to go. You have to have the God-given judgment and you're insensitive, you're sensitive to the Holy Spirit so He can direct your judgment. No judgment. You can't judge nothing. Yeah. 
use the measure. Go up to the verses above that. I can't preach that sermon right now. I've got to keep going. And Isaiah says, wash yourselves and make yourselves clean. I just can't, I just can't help it. Yeah, wash yourselves. Now listen. Take your evil deeds out of my sight and stop doing what's wrong. It's sometimes been easier to tell people who are caught in sin to say, stop. It's sometimes easier for people to just stay one day, come to their senses, and smell the coffee and go, it's time to get up. i got to quit doing this. Thank God for the times that he illuminates people's minds and they say, oh, I get it. I get it. Stop doing, just stop. Just quit. You don't have to have 12 steps. Just stop. If you need 12 steps, take 13. But stop. And you quit. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless and plead for the widow. And you, widows have, have a, a handicap placard in their lives that people need to be understanding of because they loved that man with all their life. They became one with him. And now he's gone. Help them. Any way you can. Whole nother sermon there, honey, but I remember when Dad went to help the little old widow lady across the path, and she was kind of good looking. Yeah, my mom would let Dad help her a little while. <laughs> so you'll need to be careful, fool. That's what I'm saying. But God's made provision for him. God cares deeply for the poor and the marginalized. And, and I want you to get a grip on this. Don't hate me forever, but woe to those who make unjust laws. If it's wrong, it's wrong. I don't care who passes it. If it's outside of the scope of God's loving kindness to us, it is wrong. We can't just shut up, put our heads down. That's not freedom. When you find the Lord, you'll be free, and you'll be free indeed. And when something interferes with that freedom, it ain't God. God wants you to be free. And, and he opposed and, and issues oppressive decrees to deprive the, you church people on yourself. No. Politics is getting into the world of the church. Not the church getting into the world of politics. It's not political to want freedom. It's not political to protect unborn life. It's a God thing. To deprive the poor of their rights and withhold justice from the oppressed of my people, making widows their prey and robbing the fatherless. Think about it, will you, so I don't have to preach it? Will you think about that? Will you think about what's going on around you? If God allows you to speak and you get the opportunity, you need to speak up. Because we are the thermometers, we are the thermostat of the world. If that thermostat if it's too cold in here, would you get up and walk and turn that up a little bit? Right now I'm kind of sweaty, so I would turn it down a little bit. But if the world around you is getting too cold to the needs of the people, then you need to turn it up. We're the church. If it's getting too hot, then we're the ones to set the thermostat and turn it down. What, what are they going to do? Throw you in jail? you got a prison ministry. Moses, tell them to let them go. You'll have words to say when you're placed in those situations. Well, what are you going to do on the day of reckoning when disaster comes to call? When God comes and says, the blood's on your hands, you could have done something and you did nothing. Who are you going to run from then? Where are you going to leave the money that's left behind? There is only one important thing. Uh, they're just training you, Chris. You're up here in a time of testing that God's preparing you for what he's got for you out here. Guys, it's what it's, we're going through, a testing period. We're here on earth. And you know what the big deal is? God's going to want to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. You had what you had, and you did your best with it, and I'm glad you did. Come on with me. Because you ain't taking it with you. you. This is later in my message, but you know what? We ain't even going to be married in heaven. We're not. We're going to be married to the bride. And we're going to get to spend time with the people we love. Oh. I, I was going 
going into the restroom and I this verse came to me and I told Kathy, I said, you got to hear this, man. There's at least three, there's a whole sermon in this one verse. And she goes, well, which one is it? And I go, man, I can't remember. But Because Mike is not my everyday, I guess I don't have it bookmarked in my Bible. But listen to this. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? What does he want from you? To act justly. Oh, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Man, that is a prescription for the church. That is a prescription because I got news for you. I got news for you if, if we're over here, we love them so much. If we love our kids so much, you need more chocolate. You need more candy canes. We're not going to punish you for stealing unless it's over $900 in value. So it's okay. If we live over here and the church ordains that, and in the church you go, well, they're just guidelines. And you adhere to them. And so we're over here lovey-dovey and kissy wissing to everybody. Just, oh, it's such a good thing. And we're going to overlook everything because there's no righteousness. There's no justice. We're, we love you that much. Or you break one rule and you're done. You mess up one time and you're finished. If we live in either... Why does that keep disappearing? If we live in either one of those, you don't find my other sermon about the sweet spot. That's not the sweet spot. The sweet spot is I got this much love because this is what we're doing. And these are the guidelines that we have so that we can love each other better, so that we can be in the body together, so that the body can grow and we have chocolate mm -hmm. and we have guidelines. Well, okay, I'm going to keep going. Everybody jumping up. Shh, quiet down now. I'm going to move ahead. He says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees and hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you've neglected the most important matters of the law. Justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You have practiced the latter, and you neglect the former. You are so blind. You are so blind. You strain a gnat out of your coffee cup, and you're chugging down a camel. You're worried about those things? You know, it's you, you need to figure out what's important. And then you need to figure out that only one thing remains. Showing Christ's love to you so that you can receive Him as your Savior and get to heaven. That's the scorecard at the end of our life. It's not how big a house did you build, not who did you influence? It's, I'm an influencer on Facebook. I can, I can show people how to live. No, 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 no. Don't forget it's love and mercy so that you can show people a way to live that glorifies Christ so that they can lead someone to Jesus. Because it's the same. It's the same. Your people and your circle of influence isn't mine. And the people nearest and farthest from you, I can't touch with the gospel. I don't want to. So God gives you that responsibility. You have today. You don't have tomorrow. You don't have yesterday. You have today to reach out and say, you know, this might not be the way to go. Maybe you'd want to try this. Reveal the will of Christ in your life. And honestly, people... God has messed your lives up, allowed your lives to be messed up so often that you should be able to have an illustration you can take to your friends. Oh, well, if my friend ever hurt my feelings, I could help him now, but I've never had that happen. If I didn't have enough money to pay the bills at the end of the month, I, I could help you, but that's never happened to me. Baloney. If you live your life, you're going to get broken. You're going to get chinked. You're going to get unleveled. How can Julio show me the dent in the back of his car if I'd never seen one before? What? What do you do there? <laughs> 
It happens. Life happens so God can reveal his will to you no matter what it is. No matter what it is. That's what Bill, I heard a preacher one time go, if you think God wants you to have a parking place close to the shopping mall front door, then you're wrong because God don't worry about those things. I baloney. Baloney. If you're dragging Ted the machine on you, God cares if you get a close parking place because not only do you have to drag a machine in the front door, you're going to run out of air even with Ted turned up on five. Yeah. We all have belabored this one. I told the kids the other night, well, I need to back up. As I was praying this week, I found Joel 2.27. Does anybody know what that verse says? The Lord says, I will give you back the years that the locusts have destroyed. Because I'm saying, God, I feel a lot better, and I think I want to coach again. And I'm thinking, but see, one of the things that I learned in youth ministry is don't write, don't let your mouth write checks that your body can't cash. That's the PG version. And so I don't want to be telling people, but God said, no, Don. Lord willing, like I learned from the Dominican people, I think I'm going to get two years back, Agus. I think one day again I'm going to have kids like this out here. I came down the other night to watch Adam doing it. Wow, I get to coach with my son. They may not want me, but I'm coming. I'm coming. You better deal with me. I told Scott yesterday, I said, you know, I was coaching the year before I left Highland. I'm coming back for my job. I don't even care if they pay me. I'm coming back. We had all these, I had 11 Gonzalez's in the church bus heading to a tournament in Dayton. Dayton. 11, and none of them were related. And they weren't even related to my daughter-in-law's Gonzalez's. My gosh! It's like, what's the Chinese thing? It's like Chen or whatever, number one name in the world. How many Gonzalez's are there in Mexico? I don't know. Because you know what? It's like this. Peter said it like this. I realize that it's true. God doesn't show favoritism. And neither should we. I was raised red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. Um, you know, it's not my fault if you all named Gonzalez. I don't care. And the one thing that really, I was so... Such a great story, and I've probably told you this, but I want you to hear this. When Josh used to come home for the holidays, he would come to my practices and sit in, because I was we had it under control. And a couple of my kids' parents didn't speak English. They spoke some other language, but it wasn't English. And Josh sat down to, and I can't remember which is the little boy's dad. It wasn't Pepe's, but... I never got to know him, and it's because he didn't speak my language. You know, he we got along, and I showed him things, and Josh sat down next to him, and Josh was like wasted for the whole practice because he kept, I could tell he was talking to him because that's how Josh talks. He talks like, you know, his uses his hands, and he goes, he's one of them hand talkers. We get in the Suburban to go home, and he goes, man, that guy's really cool. Dad, what did, do, you, do you like that guy? I said, Josh, I've never said two words to that guy. He said, well, you need to talk to your parents. I said, I would if I could speak Spanish. And he said to me, well, he didn't speak Spanish. He speaks English. I said, man, you sadly mistaken because he don't speak a word of English. And Josh looked at me and he goes, but that's what I thought I heard. That's what he did. And I told the board the other night, that's the kind of church I want. I want us to communicate with each other on a level that is beyond words. That's beyond, that we know what we know what we know, and we love each other. That was so incredible to see him having this big half an hour conversation with somebody that didn't even speak my language. <laughs> oh, and I called John's old number last, the other night. The lady said, Dominato arigato. I got a Japanese person on the end of his phone. I go, 
well, I'm sorry, but that's, see if I said that's, that, you're not John. Because <laughs> I didn't think John would answer his phone speaking. And I only knew that Japanese line because that my dad taught me that from being in the war. And I said, I'm sorry, but I didn't have a Japanese area code. That John's old number is not, don't do that, guys, unless you know Japanese. And God, you want to know, is absolutely pro-life. He's about life. You want to get into a debate, well, well, I'll leave that for him to preach that sermon. Shall not murder. Some of the worst battles that Israel fought, they went to the town and the God said, you will not take anything from them and you'll beat the dirt when you leave. You won't take gold, you won't take silver, you won't take idols, you won't take prisoners. Because they sacrificed to altars. They didn't sacrifice perfect pigeons. They didn't sacrifice a perfect bull. You know what they sacrificed? Nod your head if you know what they sacrificed. If you're not nodding your heads, I'm going to tell you. They sacrificed babies, innocent blood. The shedding of innocent blood the Lord abhors and detests. If there are people, now think about this. Exodus says this. If people are fighting and they hit a pregnant woman, that's it, widows and pregnant women. Guys, I just want to tell you, there's always been a prohibition about being <clears throat> harming a pregnant woman. Don't do it. Don't do it. If she gives birth to someone because she's been hurt and no serious offender um, and no serious injury is caused, the offender must be fined whatever the woman's husband demands and the court will allow. Now, I don't know if there's too many attorneys in here, but how would you like to have a case where a guy damaged a pregnant woman? <laughs> ching, ching. We're going downtown. And then you go on to verse 23. How can you do this? But, you know, Jesus came to, to fulfill the law, not abolish the law. That's right. Because there he says, but if serious injury does, if there is a serious injury, you are to take a life for a life, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth, and a hand for a hand, and a foot for a foot, a burn for a burn, and a wound. How can God be like that? I want to tell you this. He put that in there because deterrence have an effect on the people's minds. If you knew that you hurt that pregnant woman, they have the ability to take your life for a life. They have the ability to take your eye for an eye. And I want you to know before you get into a ruckus, if there's a pregnant lady there, I love innocent life in that woman. You wish you had a millstone tied around your neck and thrown into the great deepest lake. So the deterrent is there. Does God say to do that? He's hoping you read that and understand that that's not what He wants. That He wants to protect them. But you know what could happen? Uh-huh. I'll tell you right now. You don't find your way to Jesus, you could go to hell too, and it would be worse than anything you've seen on this earth. So there's a deterrent for you. See, because, and I love this, and I've been stuck here ever since I preached it and got banned from YouTube with it. God wondrously and magnificently created you in your mother's womb and knit you there. He was there when you were formed. He was there, and I praise you because you're fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. Man, look at your own body. Look at your own life. I'm going to share some things with you today that, that if you will look at your own body, it's amazing. It's amazing. We can't even figure out a bee's eye, a fly's eye. It's amazing what God has done. Your frame wasn't hidden from God when He created you. When you were made in that secret place, that secret place where two human beings become one and a baby is made it's not a surprise to god 
and that secret place he wove the part of her, the part of him together. And your eyes saw my unformed body from that day on and ordained me with the books. And you know what I say about that? You know, we all want to have our name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and we all have a book about our lives that we're living. We really do. Maybe that's why everybody thinks once they retire, they've got to write a book about their life. Well, okay, it's a natural tendency. But I said this, and this is what I came through the valley of the shadow of death with. Satan's got a book with your stuff in it, too. And Satan, he's making pornography with your book. And he wants to use that book against you when you go before the judge, who is Christ, and he's going to defend you. And if your name's in the book, you win. If your name ain't in the book, I have never experienced torment that great to be able to see what I saw and know what I know and to have Jesus put his hand on my back and go, yeah, you had faith. Come with me. Come with me. As your days were ordained before you in your book and, and, and before one of them came to be, before one of them came to be. You don't, that's why I said, we don't have tomorrow, but God already knows. And, and well, how can God know if I do this or that? He knows what will happen whether you do either one, because he already knows. He's not in linear time. You think, well, if I disobey him here, then how does he know I'm going to end up there? Because he already knows the outcome. He knows if you disobey him and you lose faith and you give your faith away, you're already going to hell. That's an easy line. But if you struggle along, he knows your struggles. And he's always there to help you and to keep you. And remember, and I said it before, you don't need a bucket load of faith. You need the faith of the size of a mustard seed. That's good enough. But it's not good enough for you to live your life. You need to grow that seed. You need to grow that seed. Because what does a corn stalk makes a whole bunch of plants? What does an apple do? Not just an apple. It makes a lot of apples and a lot of seeds. On, the, on this side right here, you see some scientists said that, some microbiologists said, we're going to make a virus that we know this virus kills animals, we know this virus kills animals, we're going to splice them together and change what they do. And on, this is a picture of a hairy straw, a hairy straw. And what happens is oxygen goes through that hole and it's tickled by those hairs. And I don't want to say this, but it makes a charge. I don't want to say electricity, because I guess that's too scary. I'll tell you, the scariest things I ever do is when the homeowner comes up behind me, and I'm working on the panel, and he puts his hand on my shoulder, and he goes, that one right there. I've pushed him away from me and said, don't you touch the panel when I'm close to it. If you want to touch the panel, I'll stand back here. Man, I watched. A, a video, Angus, of a crow that decided he would peck on the insulator up on the hot wire there. I thought, wow, this guy's going to blow up. Uh-uh. He went peck, boom. Randy, there was, no, there was no explosion or nothing. He was dead. Like that. Inside this straw, in my lungs, it gets tickled by those curly cues and a charge is made, and that's what takes O2 and puts it in my blood so that my lungs can make oxygen. Now, in a critter or a parasite, it opens up their lungs and they die. Their apparatus is not like a human being's. This is like a human being's. So that's where I'm, what this two things hooked together made in another country did was close that up. My body said, no, we don't want this foreign thing in me, so it closed like that. So then I take this thing that I can't disclose, and it attaches itself to these little, you see these things right here? This thing that I have blocks it like this and makes the passageway large enough to take the oxygen to my blood, and I can breathe. How wonderfully are you made? How miraculous is your God? 
It's an incredible thing that he's done in our hearts and lives. All of that! So you can love your kids and introduce them to Jesus. All of that! So you can love your neighbor as yourself and show them to the Lord. Because it wasn't about that. It was about this. Do you love me enough to follow me? God wasn't biting his fingernails about my health issue. Folks, I have been able to lead a lot of people to Jesus, and I would have been happy to be to say I've done my thing. And I'm gonna tell you when you're that beat down and when you've been deoxygenated for that long, <clears throat> it's easy to want to quit. And I don't I'm not the guy that says if you commit suicide you're going to hell. I'm the guy that says I sure wish you hadn't done that, but God is the judge, and Jesus died on the cross to decide that. Jesus died so that he could say, come home, or thou shalt not kill. It ain't for me to judge. I'm just saying I'm going on the evidence that I've been shown. And Jesus is about sex being between a man and a woman. Church is so political. It's not either. Marriage should be honored by all. And marriage should be, bed should be kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. You, you, you have, kind of have to go along with me here because if you don't think this is the word of God, then we all were, yeah, I should have left at the beginning of the message because this is what God says. Keep your lives free. And why do you think this is here? You ever imagine why sexual immorality and money always get tangled together? Because the love of money is the what? It's the root of all evil. The love of money. You think this world is it, so I want to get some. And be content with what you have. Oh, really? Because God has said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Because enough is enough. I never trained my wrestlers not to go for first place. What I trained my three boys with was to be the national, to be an All-American. I said, guys, if you set your sights on being an All-American, that's high enough. For, that's, I, I can't even imagine that level. And so we never said, oh, well, if you, if you can beat Highland, or if you can beat East Valley, you've arrived. I never do that. Never. But, but, I would be contented if you set your goals high and you did all your God-given ability and have it come forth. And they did. They far exceeded sports abilities that I ever had. And it's that way in our lives, too. You don't hope for nothing. <laughs> Pastor Flesher said, your expectations low, but be delighted in everything that happens. In other words, don't be upset if you didn't win the Super Bowl. They never got called for holding one time in any of their Super Bowls. Angus, my wife told me that. I don't care, because that's not what Jesus is about. Jesus is about, did you love me? Did you love me? So if we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I don't have to be afraid. You know, I had a sermon on that, you know, realize the angel told the, the shepherds not to be, don't be afraid. And they still were. Time and time again, he tells people not to be afraid. In other words, you can choose not to be. You can choose not to be. What can mortals do to you? Whatever they do to you here on earth is counted as joy in my Father's kingdom. Yeah, yeah. You get slapped around, stay true because it's a bonus. This is incredible. I love this thing. And I do this in every one of the weddings I do. This is why a father, this is something we believe. This is why a man leaves his mother and unites to his wife and they become one flesh. See these two lives coming together in this ceremony, in this moment in time? You're coming together, and the whole married life depends upon 
the importance that you place in your commitment to God and then to each other. If two couples will do that, I, I kid with Angus all the time. I'd rather do a funeral because at least we know where that person ends up. But you would marry people. Oh my gosh, stop it. Stop it. Pastor Fletcher said, the importance that you place upon this union will depend upon the importance you place on your wedding and your marriage and your work to be on the same track with God. Haven't you read, he said, in the beginning the Creator made them what? Adam and Steve? No. He made them male and female. And he said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and unite with his wife and the two will become one flesh. Science can't do that. Therefore, what God has joined together and I highlighted that. I mean, I tallied that. God forbid you'd break up another one's marriage. When God joined two people together in an intimate relationship, bonding DNA, and you would choose to separate them. Why then, they asked, did Moses command that, that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? God says you can get a divorce. You know what Jesus said? Because you've got hard hearts. You've got hard hearts. It's the hardness of your heart that God wants you to break this union that God has brought together. But it wasn't that way in the beginning. Adam and Eve were one. She came from his body. And they stayed together. I tell you, if anyone divorces his wife, except for, for immortality, and marries another woman who commits adultery. And it, it was Billy Graham that's always used this verse right here. He said, uh, never thought about divorce, but I had a problem with that murder one. So, so he says, Ruth and I never talked any past that. The disciples said to him, well, if this is a situation, and this is a noble statement between a man and a wife, it's better not to marry. Amen. It's true. If you can't commit at that level, that's why sex before marriage doesn't work because there's no commitment. And I don't think Kathy and I would have made it if we hadn't committed to God and each other simultaneously because if I run from her, God's going to hunt me down. If I run from God, oh my, Steve, your wife will make sure that you're not going very far. Ha, huh, Julio. That's why it takes the three... Oh, why? There's that three again. Because your spouse is in touch with the Holy Spirit. And you better be. Or your spouse, you better be. Never, never, never forget the lady over there at the Bethel Church. Had we prayed in prayer meeting tears for her husband to find Jesus and quit drinking. He found Jesus and quit drinking and she quit going to church. Come on, people! When God answers your prayer, rejoice! You're going to get what you want unless you really don't want it. So he told him, you, know, you better not to marry. Better not to marry. You ever done that? We went on a, a cruise one time. I think we've been to two cruise, three cruises. But anyway, we flew out from Portland with a gal who just got married. You know why she got married? Because she was approaching 30 and her friends told her she needed to get married. She had more fun with us on the cruise than she did her husband because he was down in the thing because he gets seasick. And she's going, why did I marry this guy? I go, man, that's a tough one, Angus. Young youth pastor like me, why did you marry? I don't know. I didn't tell you to. Some people better not be married. You know that? Some people. I can't do marriage counseling from the pulpit, so talk to me later. But in Matthew, Jesus replied to them, not everyone's going to believe what I'm telling you guys. Not everyone's going to understand the relationship it is between magical relationship between a husband and wife. You, you know things about each other that, thank goodness, the world don't even know. You share intimate details with each other. 
<laughs> See, on the way in, my wife said, you're going to use up all your words, Don, and you ain't going to have any left. I got left. I got some left. Oh, you think I'm going too long? Yeah, well, we'll see, won't we? Even Unix, if, if you don't know what that is, you can go home and look through the, the Thorith. I can't say that because the hole in my bottle was too big, but if you want to look it up, you can look it up. In other words, accept the lot in life that he's given to you. Because you know what? The law was made for man. Not man for the law. Remember that balance beam I showed you? you got to find the sweet spot between what God has created and what God can allow you and direct you to do. Because we need both of the genders. We need both strong people and kind people and soft people. We need both. We need a balance between the two because in the same way husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one has ever hated his own body, but they feed and care for it too much. Sometimes we feed them. Just as Christ loves the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and unite to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery. Jesus, you know, we're talking here. This is a profound mystery. And I'm talking about the church. Woo! Christ and the church have this. However, each one of you must love his wife as he loves himself. And ladies, you've got to respect the guy that's living for the Lord. You've got to give him some slack. Because we're not like you. Sometimes we don't do things that you think we should do, but we're, it's okay. They're all small things. Christ loves the church. He loves the church so much that he gave himself for us. You guys in this room, these guys around the world that are celebrating Christ today. And I love the lion and the lamb. I mean, if you've never had a bummer lamb, you need to go back in one time and be a little kid and have a bummer land that only loves you, that sees you come and it goes meh, meh, and runs up to you and bumps up against you. You need to understand and the lion. My goodness. I don't know. How does God do it? He joins us together. He allows us the privilege we have becoming one like Christ loved the church. Stand together. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your great love for your church. Realizing that we people are the church. That we together and the love we share is from you. And we pray that you'll ordain us to be witnesses to the fact that Jesus, you are the Son of God. Truly, Father, we pray your blessing upon those who are here today. And let our weaknesses be the strength of our neighbor. And let our neighbor's weaknesses be our strength. Let's share each other's burdens as we move forward. And let's always demonstrate you. Demonstrate you to the world. And allow us to be blameless in the time of testing. That we'll come through it and you're going to go, I knew you'd make it. I knew you'd do it. God, we pray for the needs that were brought forth here today. We thank you for the healing that you can do because you know you know how we're made. And we pray that we will be in the thermostat that controls the temperature of our worlds. That go with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. And the people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.